The following program is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not to be considered legal advice. Fraudsters Radio was created to expose the many scams and frauds that have so infected society today. Scammers, fraudsters, and rip-off artists abound, whether it's scamming homeowners with bogus foreclosure relief services, dating fraud, incompetent lawyers, or consumer rip-offs. It's high time the public has a voice. If you work in a profession that deals with fraud, or if you believe you were or are a victim of fraud, you now have a radio listening public that wants to hear from you. Please feel free to message us through our Fraudsters Radio Facebook page, and we may have you on the show as a guest. If you'd like to call in for today's show, the number is 646-668-8512. Welcome, and thanks for joining us on Fraudsters Radio Show. I am Lori Z, nationally syndicated radio host and consumer advocate, along with my co-host, Storm Bradford, who's the owner of Mortgage Fraud Examiners. Glad to have you here, Storm. Nice to be with you again, Lori. Well, and I've got a special guest coming on the show today who's been on all of the major TV networks. Uh, his name is Andy Selipak, PhD. He'll be on in eh, probably about 10 minutes or so. He's the director of social media, MAMC Social Media, at the College of Journalism and Communications at the University of Florida. So I've got 20 million questions to ask him on fraud today. He'll be a, a good guest. I know you can't stay with us, but I figure for the first few minutes of the show today, maybe talk a little bit. You know, I've always mentioned that you're the owner of Mortgage Fraud Examiners, and we've had some previous shows, but, you know, I've known you for a long time. Tell people what you do and why you do it. Well, I've had a litigation support company for for almost 40 years, and uh, we started out uh, doing, we had one of the first innocence projects, getting wrongly convicted people out of jail, and then we started having attorneys coming to us, well, if you can get them out of jail, you must know how to keep them going in the first place, so we started doing that for a number of years, and then more and more attorneys were saying, well, do you do civil work, and we said, well, yeah, we can uh, you know, we can show you how to win any type of case. So we got involved in big civil cases, had one where we got our client $18 million from Dole Pineapple, um, had wrongful death cases where we got clients multi-millions, uh, legal malpractice cases, and so forth and so on. And about 11 or so years ago, we started getting a bunch of calls from, home, uh, from um, lawyers around the country, how do you win these foreclosure cases? And we said, well, you have to attack the contract. And we thought at first we'd start teaching attorneys how to do it, but it came pretty clear to us that it would take as long for them to go through what we'd have to teach them as it did to go through law school. So we said, we'll just do the exams for you. Thus, Mortgage Fraud Examiners was created. And then out of Mortgage Fraud Examiners, we started getting calls from pension funds and hedge funds who buy these notes that come to us and want us just to examine the notes for them. So basically, that's what we do for a living, and uh, as the commercials say, mortgage fraud examiners uh, helps homeowners uh, keep their homes. Right. Now, you're the only company in the country that does this specific type of thing, correct? Correct. Yeah, nobody does what we do. There's a lot of scams out there, securitization audits, forensic loan audits, but they're they're total scams. Matter of fact, um, we... uh, we don't know of any one of those companies, or excuse me, I should put it another way, any one of the homeowners that have used those companies, almost every single one of them have been foreclosed on or in the process of being foreclosed on. Right. Now, you also have a Facebook page, the uh, foreclosure strategies that really work. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we started the Facebook page for homeowners that could come to it and learn strategies on how to, on how to save their home. Um, you actually are a co-administrator there. So, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. We're all about helping homeowners, you know, avoid foreclosure and be able to save their homes with strategies that actually work. Got it. All right, and just a little bit about me. I'm a nationally syndicated radio host. I've done a number of shows over the years. Most of them focus on consumer advocacy, um, especially here in Florida, where it just seems to be so much crime running rampant and nobody does anything about it. Um, Somebody's got to try to stand up for 
to people or at least point them in the right direction of, of how they can get help. Um, I work as a credit consultant, so I help consumers that have their credit. I actually teach them how to develop positive credit and how to you know, deal with situations that they have. Sometimes I even have to send them out to a lawyer or to a referral person if it's a specialist in a certain situation. And one of the reasons that we do this show is, is for you listeners to understand different types of fraud because we've done shows now, what, with the FBI, uh, with the IRS, you know, with different, with different attorneys to try and, and let people know um, what can be done to prevent fraud in a particular situation also, what can they do if they've been defrauded? I think the most difficult part, though, of doing the shows like with the FBI is that there just aren't enough people there to be able to help people that have been ripped off. And that's something that we try to focus on. What are your other options? What do you think? Well, you know, Laurie, uh, you know, you're kind of like what we do at Mortgage Fraud Examiners. You're fighting against all the scams out there that are – companies who allegedly will remove things from somebody's credit reports, and actually they're scams. So when you fight through battles like we do, we're trying to educate homeowners that, look, this is what doesn't work, but here's what does work. You basically do the same thing. Here's what doesn't work, but here's what does work. And that's uh, that's the whole thing. I, I think the one FBI agent said it better than anybody he says the way you stop these scams is to educate the public. And that's what we're all about on Frontiers Radio. Right. So if you are listening to the show now, you can also check out our Frontiers Radio Facebook page. Please like it. Um, we also take requests if you have a particular situation we can look into, and you can message us again through the Fraudsters Radio Facebook page. We, we like helping people, but I, I, I know for me, and I'm sure for you sometimes, but maybe more so for me, I find it personally frustrating when um, I listen to a story of someone who, for example, we had a guest who got ripped off, uh, her mother got ripped off for $135,000 in a wire fraud transaction. And I'm frustrated, uh, Storm, when sometimes there's just nothing that you can do. It does. It just doesn't seem fair. Well, and it's not fair. And, and, and unfortunately, what happens to a lot of these people, the scammers that scam them, inoculate them, and tell them when their scam doesn't work, it's not because my system didn't work for you. It's because of the court system. So there's always an excuse for the scammers. As I like to tell people, losers lose, winners win. If you, if you do something and it makes sense, there's an old adage, if it doesn't make sense, it's nonsense. So look at it, and we try to warn our listeners that look at what you're being told, and if it doesn't make sense, it's nonsense. Right. A perfect example of that is, is the attorney that you, you uh, posted on this morning. Actually, you responded back to somebody when you had posted about an attorney down here in Florida that's actually in a lot of legal trouble at this point. It's hard to believe even the bar says he's in legal trouble because they don't always do anything. And uh, someone tried to like basically insult you. <laughs> and I looked at it and went, okay, another person that doesn't have a clue, that doesn't yeah. see how it works. As you noticed, my answer back to him is, before you start running your mouth, you should know what you're talking about because this individual, I think he got disbarred on Friday. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But uh, okay. I haven't read the article yet on it or not. But, I mean, here's this guy saying that this guy saved all these homes. He saved no homes. He even admitted no, I think that he was a small attorney uh, in, in an article in the Tampa Bay Times he told the reporter, he says, look, he says, all we could do is stall. He says, the bank's eventually going to take your house. Well, that's because he's incompetent and he doesn't know how to examine a mortgage transaction and doesn't know that there's a lot of things out there to help homeowners. Right. I think the judge said that he needed mental help because, as I recall in reading that article, one of the um, cases was he had one of the homeowners he was representing sign over to a company he was a part owner in the, the deed to the property. So that's, how can you represent a client and then have them sign something over like that? Yeah, but that's not just one property. He's done it to several. Okay. He's basically ripping the homeowners off. That's what he's doing. So it's really sad, but, you know, so be it. That's why we're here. We're trying to educate people. 
you know, wake right. up. And help the we've got the we've got the answers, and we're exposing the frauds. Right now, what I am going to try to do for an upcoming show uh, is get someone maybe from one of the police departments down here because we have uh, a situation where where homes are being rented out, but not by people who own them. So there was a situation recently where. Uh, some woman was in her home and the door was unlocked because she was expecting company and a family of people walked in there and couldn't figure out what was wrong because they were told they were renting that property. Uh, There's another situation where 14 families showed up at the same time to a property to rent it uh, after the scammer collected all the money and disappeared. And that to me is, is like... Well, what if I want to go rent a house? Now I have to go find out from, you know, if it doesn't have a property manager, I'm going to have to look it up in public records and see, which it's really ridiculous that you have to do this because you can't trust anybody. Well, you've got to know who you're dealing with. I mean, uh, it's, it's sad that this is the way the world is now, but, I mean, you really got to make sure that uh, whoever you're talking to is not some scam artist. I don't know. Well, it seems there's more and more, and they're becoming sneakier and sneakier. They're getting better at the phone calls. They're getting better at the emails. Uh, you know, they're getting better at the mail, which it would be mail fraud, of course, if it came through that way. But it almost seems like there. Are, it seems to be like there are many more criminals, and due to the age of technology, they're able to scam people much, much quicker. So while technology can be a good thing, it can also be a bad thing in this case. Absolutely. But, you know, I, we tell our clients, I tell our clients all the time, stay the hell off the Internet. 99% of what's on the Internet dealing with foreclosures is nonsense. It's, it, they're scam artists trying to scam homeowners. So, right. again, if the process doesn't make sense, you need to understand the process first. If they're telling you something that's nonsensical, trust me, it is. You, it, whatever the process that somebody's using, if that doesn't make sense, it's a scam. Right. But, again, scary because nowadays who do you trust? If you can't trust the attorneys, then who can you trust? All the work then becomes something that you have to do is due diligence yourself. And I don't know if a lot of people understand how to actually look things up when it comes to that. Well, you know, I wish there were more shows like ours where I wish we had a television show where we could, meet, you know, uh, have millions of listeners so the listeners could understand what we're exposing and just continually, you know, uh, educate the public on what's going on out there. Not like seven on your side where somebody's been screwed by somebody, but actually – Telling people, here's the types of things that you need to look out for, and here's the types of things that are known scams. Right, and I think the people that have been scammed are afraid to come forward, uh, Storm, because I put out lots of posts on social media. You know, if somebody's been scammed, let me, let me know. We might do a show about it. But it's, it's actually amazing to me. I don't get a large response. I do get some I don't get a large response. Even when I write, you don't have to use your, your real name if you want to just call in about a question or, you know, we, we can find a specific uh, a guest to answer that question. So what do you think is the fear of people calling in? Well, I, my analogy is it's like date rape. You have these poor women who were sexually assaulted or accosted by somebody that, Maybe they brought back to their apartment or maybe they went to their apartment and then all of a sudden things got out of hand and now they're afraid to call the police because they get the police involved and then they're going to start investigating the woman's background and then they're just afraid. You know, what's going to come out of this because if if they ever went after the person who actually did it to them, that defense attorney is going to get him on the stand and eat him alive. Right. So, but the other, that's, the other thing, that's the fear. Yeah, the, right, that's the fear. The other thing, too, is if the person's name is discovered now, uh, you know, your information is all over the internet. Internet, It's all over. Just type in your name uh, in quotes and see what comes up, and, and it's, it's scary. I mean, there's stuff that I wrote, you know, years ago that still pops up, but... Here in Florida, if you are a registered voter, 
your your name, your address, and your date of birth show up on a website. So it's really easy to find somebody. And that, I think, is another reason why people may be scared because you can't really eliminate that information. You might get rid of some of it, but you're not going to get rid of all of it. Well, you know what's kind of scary is right now uh, the shortstop for the uh, uh, Washington Nationals baseball team, when he was going to college um, back in 2011, he tweeted out a couple things, and he made like a homophobic uh, remark and something that could be classified as semi-racial, and this just popped up now. And oh, here's years later, you mean? Yeah, here's something. Seven years later, somebody said something on Twitter, pops up, and now all of a sudden this is national news about this guy. Wow. Well, that's kind of that's scary to me that it could come up. Yeah. That's the show that we should probably do is uh, get an expert on on how to remove yourself from the Internet. You know, that's that's a good idea. The only way I actually did speak to an attorney once at that point and they said you, you would if it's something that's derogatory, you know, or harmful to your reputation, defamation, and you couldn't find out who it is, you can actually um go to court and do a John Doe case. Maybe you could explain what that is. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, you know, it's like us, for an example, because we, uh, you know, at Mortgage Fraud Examiners, besides Foster's radio show, for years, we've been exposing these scammers. Well, what do these scammers do? The scammers turn around, and they put on uh, right stuff, you know, make up total lies under assumed names at uh, this company called Ripoff Reports. And Ripoff Reports, the guy who started it, had a very altruistic reason for starting it. He said, look, here's a place people can go if they've been ripped off by a company and basically complain about uh, you know, how they were ripped off. Well, over time, the uh, competitors in business and people who got exposed to scammers by a different company, they could go on under an assumed name and let's say you have Laurie Zook Enterprises. And I could go on under an assumed name and say, well, I got ripped off. Uh, I paid Laurie Z, excuse me, Laurie Z uh, uh, Enterprises uh, company, and I paid them $50,000. And the uh, and when I asked for my money back, they told me to kiss where the sun doesn't shine. Then under another assumed name, I say the same thing. Well, I paid them $25,000. Then under another assumed name, and so I have a 10 assumed names now have all basically complained on ripoff reports that this Laurie Z Enterprises did so-and-so and so-and-so. And it makes Laurie Z Enterprises look like some scam organization. This is a problem. And yet you can sue, but for the normal, the normal person on the street, these, uh, you go hire an attorney to do that, uh, you're talking some bucks. Right. Well, let's do this. Let's take a short break. I want to find out from Jason if our if our guest is on with us yet. Okay. J- Jason? Yes. Yes. Yes, is is our guest on? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's do a quick commercial break. Uh Storm, I know that you have to leave us. So, got we'll hear on. Uh, it's a good thing that I have to run cuz I know I'd butcher the guy's name. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave it in your very capable hands, and uh, we'll get back together again next Monday. Enjoy All right, the show. sounds good. All we'll right, take we'll take a quick break, and we'll, right. we'll be back. Thanks with uh, Andrew Felipak, so stay with us. Have you received a notice of foreclosure on your property? Do you suspect that you're involved in an unfair or fraudulent loan agreement? Are you looking for a way to save your home? Would you like to cut through all the misinformation and find out what really works? Would you like to learn strategies that the so-called gurus aren't aware of? If you answered yes to any of those questions, a professional team at Mortgage Fraud Examiners can assist you and your attorney with all of these things and more. 
contract breaches, errors, statutory regulatory violations, fraudulent appraisals, and other fraudulent conduct cause most mortgages to be legally problematic. In fact, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation found that nearly 2,000 financial institutions they assess received citations for significant compliance violations. They also examined appraisals and found out that of the 259 appraisals reviewed for accuracy, only seven fully complied with professional standards. Call us at 844-920-7200. That's 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, 844-920-7200. And welcome back on Fraudsters Radio. I've got a special guest, Andrew Selipak, Ph.D., Director, MAMC Social Media at the College of Journalism and Communications from the University of Florida. Welcome, Andy, to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, you and I had a great uh, great talk last week, and so now we're going to let the listeners, I'm going to ask the questions, and we can kind of go through a bunch of stuff. Um, would you just do sort of a little bit about yourself and how you got into what you're doing now? Um, well, essentially, I, I decided uh, I really enjoyed teaching. I had an opportunity to teach uh, a uh, community college course before I went on to get my Ph.D. and then realized that I enjoy being in the classroom and, and teaching students, and, and that led to the opportunity to be in charge of a graduate program in social media. And uh, I moved to Florida in 2007, and 11 years later, here I am. Well, you've been doing really good for yourself because you've been on all the major news networks, um, which is just just fantastic because you can get a a lot of uh, important information out about the social media through that. And so, you know, I have a whole list for you today, uh, but I'd like to start with in in social media fraud. Let's actually start out with Facebook fraud because I think, to me anyway, that seems to be the most common. Now, how I found you, I want to give a little shout out to the Bottom Line magazine because I love this magazine. It gives you all kinds of important information. And so you had written an article called Protect Your Personal Data on Facebook. And so um, we're going to talk about Facebook. I want to talk about the article first a little bit. Uh, You talk about shutting out third-party apps. What does that mean and why should listeners do that? Well, a lot of times people will go on to Facebook, and and I use the example with my students to kind of classic and maybe dated example of you can click on the link and find out which Harry Potter character you are. Um, There's always a lot of those on your Facebook timeline. And essentially, you click on a link and it goes, hey, uh, why don't you give us some information? And based on your information, we can tell you, you know, a made up Harry Potter character that (laughs) relates to that information. And all it is is a third-party company collecting your, – you're offering up all the information that, granted, you've already given to Facebook. Um, you're offering them all the same information, your uh, email address, your location, your friends, how active you are. It, it just provides them with so much that they can then sell to someone else so advertisers can market directly to you. So there's a lot of those things that exist on Facebook. And, and I would say that there's luckily a little – I feel like there's a little bit less than there was maybe a few years ago. But that's a really simple way where people will take these online tests that you you provide your information to some company and you don't really know who they are. And they then have a a lot of information about you that they can use and sell and uh, target and message, uh, basically advertising directly to you. So is that how the ads come through when you advertise on Facebook? Is it from that third-party you know, app-type information? Well, you, the ads that you see on Facebook are based on a variety of different things. It's everything from uh, when you go into some of these stores and they ask, you know, do you want to sign up for a, a rewards card? And you're like, sure, because I want to get 10% off of something. And they always want your email address. Well, the thing is, with most of the social media accounts that you sign up for, you sign up with your email address. So now the company can has your email address and they can target advertising directly to you based on that. Or you know, they ask for these rewards cards, ask for your phone number. Again, that gives another way for them to target advertising directly to you. But the big thing is just going to the different websites and you know you just leave a trail of cookies everywhere you go and that yeah. information is connected and that's how they find you. Yeah, it's scary. Everybody has they, everybody has something on you. Now I know you can change your settings also, but you wrote um, in this in this article, don't let your likes become ads. How do likes become ads? 
Well, one of the things that you do is by liking different pages, you're providing Facebook with more information about the topics that you're most interested in. You know, and a lot of people don't create Facebook ads or, you know, uh, have a company where they're putting together Facebook ads. We use it more for just a personal communication um, way to stay in touch with family and friends. But if you ever create a Facebook ad, the things that you do is you can target specific populations with your Facebook ads based on demographics and psychographics, such as uh, location or age. But then there's other things like, I like pizza, or I like um, hiking, or I like British television. And all that information is based on the things that you've liked on Facebook, the different pages you've liked, or it's by checking in to certain locations. Um, or sim simply because you know you are friends with people who have similar interests, so it's a way to kind of get information about you. One of the biggest things that people need to realize with with social media is that they're just collecting information. It's not so that they can you know provide you with something you know they want to show off the things that you're interested in, but they want to know things like what college did you go to, what's your current occupation, your relationship status, your political party affiliation. All those make it easier for them to then target advertising to you based on that information they collect. Got it. Well, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I know sometimes if I've liked something that I've seen on Facebook, and then, if, for example, if I'm on my, my iPad at night reading late at night, and I go on to, you know, into the Internet and I'm, I'm reading an article, all of a sudden ads for what I just looked at or liked are appearing on, the, on my, you know, my Safari when I'm look, browsing through. So I'm figuring somehow – it, it, it's the cookies, I guess, are picking up the same information, and now they're showing me ads for what I just looked at. And I go, wow, that's like a really smart computer to be able to do that. Well, and honestly, one of the funniest things is that last night, uh, my father's birthday is coming up, so I was looking for a birthday gift for him. And, and I, there's a company, Legacy Box, where you, you can send old pictures, and they put them on like a DVD for you. Yeah. And I looked that up just to see what the prices were, and I was like, okay, it's a, it's a little expensive. Close the browser on my desktop. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to grab my phone, check my notifications. I'm a bit of a social media addict and went to Instagram. Four posts down was an ad for Legacy Box. I had never looked it up uh -huh. before, had never seen it before. Uh -huh. okay. And the turnaround time on that was probably less than a minute. Uh, then earlier today, I actually was on Facebook on my phone. I was scrolling through my timeline and found another ad for Legacy Box on my timeline on Facebook. I had There was nothing about that company other than me hearing ads on the radio for it until I searched for it last night. But because all of my devices are connected and I'm leaving this right. you know, trail of cookie crumbs behind me, uh, you, know, you get this targeted advertising because they know, hey, you seem to be interested in this. Why don't we remind you that you're interested and these ads pop up? And it's, you know, there's a creepiness factor to it that I think once people yes. see, they're like, oh, my God, like, how did that happen? That's me. I go, how did that happen? I just looked at it, and now it's on, you know, and so I'm figuring the, the ads are getting smarter, but that, that's scarier because when some of the other things we're going to talk about, it can be deceptive when it's from people rather than from companies. Now, you, you also talk about not letting Facebook sell your browsing data. So there, there is a way to go in online and change that, correct? Well, you can decide uh, to what extent you want the, your data to then allow advertising directly targeted to you. And it's one of those things where you basically have to turn it off. Um, it's kind of like with a lot of things. You have to turn off whether or not you want you know, location services. You have to turn off whether or not you want uh, like a tweet to include where you're located. So it's possible to kind of turn these things off, but at the same time, even doing that, it's, it's not necessarily that helpful. Uh, one of the other things I mentioned before is you can basically turn off your location on your cell phone, and that's one of the ways that different apps will track you. But the problem is, is that then a lot of things simply don't work. Like if you turn off your location, Google Maps won't work. And the whole purpose of Google Maps right. is to know where you're going or how to get there. So if you turn off location services, uh, suddenly that app won't work. Uh, it also means that you'll – it's not that you'll stop getting ads. It just means that the ads won't be location-based. So I'll still get an ad online if I'm on a website or on social media – but instead of getting the pizza place down the street, I might get a pizza place located in Detroit, Michigan, because it can't figure out where I'm located. About where you are. 
Right. So it's one of those things no, where it's there. You you can kind of hide, but by hiding, uh, all you do is you get irrelevant ads. You're, it's not going to stop getting the ads. It just means that Facebook, they're going to have less value. Facebook figured out a system for that too. If you, if you yeah. turn it off, they have some way to to do something. And interestingly, I know when I spoke with you last week, after I spoke with you, um, you know, when I I happened to look at my Facebook Messenger, and it had already connected us, even though. We were just on the phone. Somehow, the messenger connected me to you. Well, one of the things that fa- I mean, I, I was actually, what's interesting is I actually was uh, teaching earlier this morning, and was talking about this exact thing with my students. And I showed them. I put up on uh, up on the screen the app permissions that Facebook Messenger wants from you, so that you can use their app. And one of them is access to your contacts. So for some reason, Facebook Messenger wants to know all of your telephone contacts so that it can let you know, hey, you know this person if you ever want to message them on uh, Messenger instead of calling them or texting them. So a lot of the apps require certain things for them to work. They require certain permissions that most of the time we don't even pay attention to. You know, We don't look at the fine print. We don't read the user agreement. We just want right. to click yes and then start using it. And you know, it's one of those things if you take a moment to see what it actually is asking for, it, again, there's a creepiness factor. And, and one of the things that happens with, with when you start talking about this topic and, and online and data mining and data protection is a lot of people I don't think understand it. And then when somebody starts talking about it, they sound like a tinfoil hat wearing nut job. But it's because <laughs> we just don't necessarily understand it. I was listening to your uh, previous segment and, and it was one of the things that kind of came up. And I was reminded of when you go, if you take your car to the mechanics and the mechanics like, well, you know, you need to get this done and this done and this done. And a lot of times we just go, okay, because we don't know enough about cars to tell them, well, I don't need a, a you know a serpentine belt sander replacement, which you know something that right. doesn't even exist. You go, <laughs> sure. And a lot of things happen the same way with online. I mean, one of the reasons why we get taken advantage of is we don't necessarily want to admit what we don't know. So we just go ahead and do things and use things, and then after the fact, we suddenly realize I got taken. Uh, you know, we are, we're happy to admit that we got taken for something, but we don't like to admit that we didn't know something to begin with. And I think that's one of the big issues is that we, we need to get to the point where we're just willing to admit, I don't know, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. And stay with me. We're going to do a short commercial break. We come back, though. we got a lot more to cover. I'm going to ask you lots of stuff. So stay with us. Back in a moment. <laughs> There is a very high likelihood your mortgage contains an extensive error. At Mortgage Fraud Examiners, we know just how costly a missed opportunity can be. For almost 40 years, we have consulted, retained, and referred to by attorneys, lawyers, trial practitioners throughout the nation. Put another way, we are the trusted source for litigation support. A foreclosure is basically an allegation the homeowner breached the contract by failing to make timely payments. The contract is clear. The borrower promised they would make timely payments, and if they didn't, the lender could take the property. The only way to overcome the homeowner's breach is to show the lender breached first. Identify errors that would void the contract. Identify regulatory violations. Identify appraisal fraud and other fraudulent contact. And the only way to find these wrongs is to thoroughly examine the whole mortgage transaction. This meticulous examination of your mortgage transaction and appraisal can identify legal defects that would make your mortgage unenforceable and entitle you to compensation or even free title to your property. Call us at 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, that's 844-920-7200. 844-920-7200. And we are back on Fraudsters Radio. And if you are a caller, you'd like to call in and ask Andy Salopak a question, the number is 646-668-8512. Now, Andy, I know we have so much to try and cover. I mean, we may actually have to do another show. Um, but I want to talk just a little bit more about Facebook because I can tell you many years ago, you know, and I, I'm sure it's still going on, the little messenger box pops up. And you get someone who appears that they they know you and they're actually in another country, but they say, hey, I've been robbed, I've been beaten, I need money, wire me money. Um, Things like that you should be suspicious of. Now, one thing I tell people is 
uh, you should lock your Facebook down to private in settings, which it, it doesn't completely help you security-wise. I mean, it does somewhat, but keep in mind, people can just copy and paste information and, and post it anywhere they want, correct? Well, yeah. I mean, that's and that's one of the things that people need to realize is that the way Facebook works is it's kind of a cloud-based service in terms of everything exists online, and that means everything's attached to a URL. So even if you have something on private, and you could have uh, even photo albums that are private only to you, uh, to where nobody can have access to it except you, those are still attached to a URL, which means if anybody has that URL, they can share it regardless of what privacy settings you're actually using. That's scary. Now, I don't post naked pictures or do anything like that, but you can for people who do. <laughs> that would be a shocker. So, you know, never a good idea anyway. Well, and, and, you know, even when you think about that, it's, you know, in the previous segment, you're talking about uh, the Nationals player from tweets from seven years ago. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, Facebook's been around in some form for over a decade now, and you could have a younger person who, or even someone, you know, any millennial really, they could have start, they could be 25 now and gotten Facebook, say, you know, maybe 10 years ago. And that means they were 15, and who knows what they were doing at 15, 16, and the, the pictures that they were posting on there and what they might have on private that's on there, but it could be available to anybody if they had access. And this is particularly important because, you know, in most states, it's still allowable during a job interview for the person interviewing you to say, hey, give me your Facebook password. I want to go check out what you've got to see what type of person you are during an interview. And when you think about that, even the privacy that you might have when you hand over your password to somebody, it doesn't matter anymore. Wow. And see, I would just say, no, and mine is private, and I don't disclose things. I do know companies, so for example, like mortgage companies will go in and look to see, you know, how somebody, if they're applying for a mortgage, how they're spending their money. Were they, you know, going on a vacation? Did they buy a big boat? Do they look like reckless spenders? Things like that. I try to keep mine private, but I know that it's never really totally private. And I think that's the thing with all social media. Um, you know, we've been talking about Facebook. What about LinkedIn? Uh, I mean, I can tell you I get bizarre emails because my email is in my, on my LinkedIn page. I've had people try to hit me up in emails saying, oh, well, didn't you get my message through LinkedIn? Or one was some man who was trying to you know, hit up on me. And I'm going, what, what's with it? So what happens with LinkedIn? Sort of the same as Facebook? Well, I mean, the, you know, LinkedIn is actually the oldest of the social media platforms that we still use, which is kind of interesting because nobody thinks about that. Um, and it, it's one of those things where it's a different user base. Uh, it generally tends to be a little bit more educated. It usually tends to be a little bit wealthier. So you, you're dealing with different types of people, but it means that if you're trying to potentially – defraud somebody, uh, you know that you're dealing with people that probably have a little bit more money and you might have a better payoff. <laughs> so it's a good place for people to try to kind of rip somebody off for that reason. And there's you know different ways to do it because we don't consider it the same as Facebook. Facebook's a lot more, well, here's my vacation photos and my family photos. Uh, so I don't want just anybody seeing them. Whereas LinkedIn, it's like, well, this is my resume, and this is how I'm networking and meeting people in my industry. So if I get a, a request from somebody that seems reasonable that this is someone I'd want to network with, I'll go ahead and accept their request. And when you do that, then they have access to a lot of different information. They suddenly know where you work. They know where you went to school, the dates for those different things, uh, who your other, other people that you're connected to. You give them a lot of information, and it becomes pretty valuable just because of the fact that you're not as careful with who you decide to accept as a connection on LinkedIn as you would for Facebook. Right, and LinkedIn, like you said, it shows their position. So if they're the CEO of a company and you're a scammer, you're going to go for the people that look like they make money. True, and you're probably also going to be looking for, you know, you can say, well, these are people that you're connected to, and in an email message, you could then name drop people so it seems like you're a little bit more legitimate because now you know, okay, well, I know they work at this place, and here's somebody else that works at this place, and here's somebody they're connected to. So in my email message to them, it's, 
a little bit easier to try to to get one over on them. It's not the you know Nigerian prince you send ten thousand dollars and you get all their money. <laughs> like you do have to be a little bit more deliberate with what you're doing. But again, you know, for people who are trying to you know get one over on somebody. It's not like you need to to be successful every time. If you're successful one out of every hundred times, you're probably able to be pretty successful by being a criminal in that way. Right, right. And they can get the email, though, like I said, off that. And so, you know, I've gotten some bizarre emails I won't even share with you, but I just sit here and go, is this what these people do all day? You know, that's what they do. And so they're hoping that they're going to get somebody who's clueless to it. And, and it's sad because they target, I think, the elderly a lot of times, too. Um, now, I know when we spoke last week, you were explaining to me about fake Tinder accounts. Can you talk a bit on that? <laughs> sure. Uh, so, <laughs> I just jump subjects, yes. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, uh, if you think about uh, there's kind of two things that relate to that. First is the fact that just as uh, for a lot of younger people, who, because they've grown up online, they've grown up with phones in their hands, you know, the, their ability to kind of engage in interpersonal communication is maybe not what it would be for other, you know, for Gen Xers and and those that are a little bit older. So online dating apps have obviously become very popular. Um, There are millions of accounts on the the different online dating apps, Tinder being one of the most popular. But the thing that you have with Tinder is that a lot of the accounts are fake. They're, they're, you know, trying to get people to do something. Um, Send me some money and I'll send you, you know, pictures. Send me some money and you can join my premium Snapchat channel. Or uh, why don't you connect with me on email? Or connect? Why don't you give me your phone number? Uh, And that's just different ways for them to collect information. Some of them are obviously a little bit more forward. Of well, if you send me information, I'll send you my phone number. And depending on you know how desperate the individual is on the other end, they might go well. You know, you look really attractive in your picture, so sure, I will Venmo you some money, and then you'll give me your phone number. But you know, there's anybody can pick any picture that they want to put on these dating apps. You know, I I could put I could right. go on to one of these dating apps and put pictures of you know potentially Brad Pitt and be like, wow, look how attractive I am. Um, now, most right. of the time, you would figure people would go, well, that's Brad Pitt. That's you know obviously not who I'm speaking to. But you know, there's so many you can get pictures from all over the web of you know different attractive people and use those as your profile pictures and convince people, oh look, I'm I'm interested in you, but you know I, I want to make sure you are who you say you are. You're really serious about this, so why don't you send me ten bucks and and that way I'll you know give you my phone number or something like that. And and that can be really dangerous because again you don't have to be successful all the time when you're trying to rip people off. It costs nothing to set up a, a Tinder account, and it costs nothing to set up a Venmo account. And all of a sudden you can start collecting money this way and. and you know, ripping off desperate people who are looking just looking for a date. Right, the romance scams. It was scary to me in, in, in talking about this is that anybody can put their picture and information that's made up on social media, on Tinder. At none of these companies actually truly verify who the people really are. It's, it's so anyone can do this, right? Well, and that's the thing. Whether it's you know Facebook or Tinder. They often – it's kind of like the police showing up to the scene of a crime. The crime's already committed. The da- damage has already been done, and then they show up because, you know, as a user, you can report, oh, I think this is fraud. I, I think this is a fake account. You can do that on Facebook and Tinder. But to the extent they then get this notification and act on it is the issue. Plenty of people could have been defrauded by that before it actually happens. Um, I had a, a, a former student of mine, and it was amazing because she must the, her pictures were used by what seemed like dozens of fake Facebook accounts a couple years ago. And what you'd have to do is report each one individually to Facebook to say, hey, this is a fake account. I know this person, which is actually pretty amazing because of the fact that at that time, Facebook already had was using facial recognition technology. So it shouldn't have been difficult for them to notice oh, this same person is showing up on 15 different profiles. Uh, <laughs> on 14 of them, they have like two or three friends. On the other one, it's like you know 2,000 friends. I bet these other 14 are fake. But again, it required people to literally go in and report them, and often multiple people to report them before anything was done about them. So that always can be an issue. And, and you know, we've seen the same thing with, with Twitter recently where a lot of – you know, bots 
accounts and fake accounts were dropped from different people. There, there was something I think uh, Katy Perry, her account lost like a couple million followers because it was determined they were all bots. So it's really important to understand that there's a lot of fake when it comes to social media. There's a lot of fake accounts, fake people, people trying to rip you off uh, because they can Yes, it's, it's a turnoff. I almost call it anti-social media because people don't pick up the phone anymore and talk to each other. They just do messenger or email, and that's it. Now, one thing I want to mention, are you familiar with TinEye? No. Okay, t if it still exists, and I believe it does, TinEye is a website where you can copy and paste a photo, let's say from someone's profile, uh, into it, and it will, it will search the web to see does that photo appear anywhere else on the Internet? So I've done that. Like if I'm not sure a person's real or not, you could just copy and paste a photo in. I think Google has an option now for that also. Um, Google, so yeah, Google Chrome, you can right-click on it, and you can do a reverse image search, and it will look for that yeah. image across Google. I, it's, it's, I, use, I use Google Chrome as my browser, and it's just a right-click, and you can do it. Right, and it's much easier to check people out. Well, I don't want you to go anywhere. We're going to go to another quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. Consumers, do you have bad credit, can't purchase a house or car, paying too much in interest on your credit cards and loans, scammed by credit repair companies? There is hope. You can get back on track and do it the right way. Call Credit Education Consultants today at 813-500-6064. That's 813-500-6064. Or go to CreditEducationConsultants.com now and get the help you need. Don't delay. Call today. Mortgage reps and realtor inquiries are also welcomed. And welcome back to Foster's Radio. I'm Lori Z, your host, and my guest, Andy Selipak. He is a social media guru, and so we've been talking about all kinds of social media. Now, I know when I look through your site, you know, we all say the fake news. Fake news. How do we know, fake, you know the news is fake? How do we know that? Do we go to Snopes? Because I've read even that is not always, you know, up to date. Well, I mean, I, it's one of those things. I probably use a broader definition of fake news than a lot of other people. I, I consider fake news not just you know things where it's malicious and, and attempting to you know convince people of something that's not real, uh, but it's also partisan news. It's news sites like The Onion. So the, my definition of fake news might be slightly broader than a lot of other people. Um, but you know, you can use a lot of those sites, like you mentioned, like Snopes, uh, like PolitiFact to kind of check the information that's on there. Uh, one of the things that Snopes does is they do a uh, like top 50 trending uh, stories going on on social media and you know, get, you know, evaluate the truthfulness of them. And yeah, I mean, there's, there have been concerns about people have said whether or not there was, there's a, a bias by Snopes itself, but generally they'll include the sources for their information, and that's where it has the, you know real great value because you can go look up where they got the information to talk about the story. It's, it's a little reminiscent of Wikipedia. I tell my students it's fine to use Wikipedia to look for stuff because at the bottom of the page they have their source material. Don't just use Wikipedia. Use the sources that Wikipedia provides, yeah, and right. then it's good information. Right, because it becomes like secondhand information. And I know I've been guilty of, you know, sometimes I'll read something and then I'll forward it to my page because maybe I want to read it later. And I have one girlfriend that will every time, every time, so so put the Snopes thing and go, it's fake, it's fake. You got to read this, it's fake. So you know, a lot of times you don't know if it's real or fake anymore. Now I, I also, I know we don't have a lot of time. I know we've got it probably about ten minutes or so. Um, talk, and this is something I read about on your site. Talk about. Uh, extremist groups using social media because that's scary. I, I can tell you, and I uh, a couple of years ago when I was hosting um, a variety show, and I did a probably a three part thing on Muslims and Islam, you know, tr you know, fact or fiction type of thing. Uh, we even had the um, the guy from the attorney from Caron locally for that show. And what was odd was I got two. These are Facebook hits from men in Afghanistan who had zero friends. And they're trying to make friends with me. So, so talk about extremist groups using social media. Well, there's a lot of different extremist groups. So I think it's, it's kind of who you're looking at and to the extent that that information is allowed. Um, you, know, you can have everything from ISIS to the Klan. So what you're dealing with is, is pretty important. You know, one of the reasons why ISIS had such a, a huge growth is they took advantage of social media. They were active on, you know, they had Facebook pages and Twitter. 
um, and they were connecting with people that way. The Klan, they're not, you know, it's usually the members of those organizations are generally a little bit older and they're not using social media and to the same extent and not don't have the professional videography that ISIS had. Um, but right. you do, you do still see these groups and organizations involved on there basically to, you know, spread their message and recruit and, and try to get more people interested because, you know, people are on their cell phones. People are, you know, engaging that way and, and you can create an online movement. Uh, and you can basically the, the biggest thing about it is, you're letting people know that there are others out there who feel the same way that you do. Before social media and the internet, that wasn't possible. If, if, you know, if you were somewhere in middle America and you had very strong beliefs about something and, and no one around you did, you would think you're a complete outlier and there's something wrong with you. But online and social media allows you to find people who hold your same views for you to realize right. I'm not alone. There are others out there that feel the same way I do. I, 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 my views aren't wrong now. Like it, it's one way to find out that because others have the same views as you, your views aren't wrong, and you can continue yeah. to believe whatever that is. Well, they fit, they fit into that group, especially if, if they're more the loner type. They can find all the other loner types, and then, of course, ISIS can, can find them. Um, what I especially find, find frightening about younger people, you know, when they go, when they have, for example, on Facebook, they have 2,000 friends. They have 5,000 friends. I think you don't have that many friends. You're a friend collector. But what you're collecting is, can be very dangerous. And a lot of parents don't realize because they don't actually look at how many friends that you know, their kids have on social media. That, that's a big part of the problem right there. And then, of course, when they're not paying attention, then kids can be targeted also, correct? Well, yes. I mean, and that's one of the things like you, you want to get younger individuals because they're more likely to be susceptible to the messages. Um, it's sort of like with advertising. You want you want a brand always wants the young customers because they'll be brand loyal for the rest of their lives. So it, targeting younger people who maybe still aren't sure about different things is always going to be uh, where certain organizations are going to look for new members. I will say, though, I, I actually just looked after you said that to see how many Facebook friends I have. I'm, I'm a little uh -huh. over 1,300, but I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty secure with who my, who my friends are on, on Facebook. <laughs> you know all 1,300, huh? Well, it's and you know that comes from colleagues, students, and everything else. Like right. I, you know, I teach probably 200 students a semester, and, and I've been doing this for 11 years. So conceivably, I should, you know, if all of my students like me enough to do that, I, I would have even more. So <laughs> it, it it is a small percentage of the students, but yeah, I, I think it, it okay. is one of those things of you know. But parents should. I mean, parents should know what their kids are doing online and and where they're going and the information that they're looking at and. Part of that, again, goes to the fact that sometimes you know, parents might not be that comfortable. They're not that experienced. They're not that media literate when it comes to using social media. Yeah, and, and you're making me think of a very sad old story, and this goes back to my space. And I'm going to say maybe 15 years ago, um, I knew a young lady. Uh, I knew her parents. She, the daughter was probably about 13 or 14 and told me that the daughter next door, her age, was on my space. And somehow was solicited by what she thought, you know, with the picture, was a, a, a young man. And she was kind of a loner and had a lot of, you know, emotional issues. And so um, this supposed young man was, you know, soliciting her to come out. This was in New Jersey, and he was in New York. And she got on a bus and went to New York, and I guess he picked her up, and he was an, old, an older fella, and he raped her. And all I could think of was, oh, my God, like, how, where were the parents, you know, doing that? So one of the things I want you to talk about, too, is, you know, other than the parents doing it, what's the best way for people to try to prevent fraud? Um, you know, you've given us a few things, but maybe give us a few more, that, especially for the parents. Well, one of the things, you know, we, we teach kids, we teach children, and, and I think all children were taught it, of don't accept candy from strangers. Um, for some reason, right. that is, we, we only apply that to in person. You know, it, it means in person, hey, you don't know that person, don't go talk to them, don't accept anything from them. Uh, for some reason, that message doesn't translate the same to online of, hey, you don't know that person because you've never met them, you haven't seen them, you haven't heard their voice, don't trust them. 
Um, so I think the very simplistic message that people have been giving for decades and decades and decades is still applicable when it comes to online. You don't know who that person is until it's potentially too late. Uh, so you, you shouldn't just trust somebody because they seem nice online. And it goes back before social media. You can think about you know, the chat groups that were part of like the dial-up AOL Internet. I mean, that was mm-hmm. another place where you could have anybody pretend to be anybody and, and go into teen chat rooms and talk to teens and, and not with the best intentions. So it, it, it goes back to the fact of, you know, you just need to make sure your kids are careful and you need to teach them that the people that they meet online may not be the person that they think they are. Uh, and if we can teach them don't get into a stranger's van and don't accept candy from strangers, it, it's the same type of concept when it comes to being online. Right. And the other thing I want to mention, and I know we laughed before, but is, is don't put nude pictures of yourself up on, on any of these sites because somehow someone will always find them. And then years later, you're going to be really embarrassed if you do go for a job interview. And so, you know, my, kind of my rule, Andy, is if I would be ashamed to have my mother read what I wrote, I don't post it. Because I think, you know, it, you have to post appropriately. And it's okay to po- post uh, your opinion, but I think some people just go too wild, you know, especially around the election time. Um, I actually had a friend, uh, two friends of 30 years, one unfriended the other because he was voting for Donald Trump. And I just went, that's, and everyone's in their 50s. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. So people go nuts on social media, but you make good points. Really, you should know the people that are on your, you know, on your site. Um, we have a couple, a couple more minutes, but also, how can people reach you if they have any questions for you, if they want to talk to you? Uh, What's I, the best way? Email is the best way. It comes, comes right – I'm usually sitting in front of my computer. <laughs> 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 so it, it comes right – I'm just sitting here, and it will pop right up. Well, why don't you give out your email address or your website? That way people can find you. Well, the website is acellapack.com. A is an apple, S is in Sam, E L E P A K dot com, uh, and email and all, everything, all the other contact information for Twitter and so forth are on there. Yeah, you're just a total wealth of knowledge. We're going to have to have you back on the show. I'm sorry, Storm couldn't stay on today. Um, before we sign off, real quick, eBay, eBay. What do you think about eBay fraud? And I, I mean, I, I sell sometimes on eBay, and I've had people try to defraud me. I try people try to defraud me on almost everything. You know, maybe I'm <laughs> older. I've had a lot. I've had a lot more experience. You know, doing a lot of these things. But what do you think about eBay fraud? We, you know, with eBay, and we we talked about this a little bit before last week. You know, to me, you always have to look at the reputation of the person selling. If they have sold one or two right. things. I'm probably not going to buy from them. If they have a low score, I'm probably not going to buy from them. It, it's reminiscent of going on to Yelp and looking at the reviews on Yelp. If a restaurant has bad reviews, I'm probably not going to eat there. If an eBay seller has bad reviews, I'm probably not going to buy from them. Right. Although I've heard people can write their own reviews under other people's names on some of these rating sites, which I would never even think of, but I have heard that. Um, so even then, that's sort of how do you, how do you know for real? True, I, and I, I think that's why you need to look at and see people who have made a lot of sales. Um, not, you know, if, yeah. if somebody has one or two like positive reviews, that's great. But I'm going to look for somebody that's made a number of sales and has a high rating on there. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where I think that's why people have kind of switched over to maybe buying from Amazon instead, because you have a little bit more protection using Amazon than you would through eBay. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope that you will, you will come back because, you know, we could dig into depth on a lot more of these things on fraud. So thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thank you for joining us today on Fraudsters Radio. Please join us again next Monday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time Live. Remember, we want to hear your stories. And you can contact us through the Fraudsters Radio Facebook page. Have your house payments skyrocketed under an adjustable rate mortgage? Have you been laid off or had your hours cut? Are bloom payments coming due? You need help from mortgage fraud examiners. To stop the housing crisis, Congress and the White House are pinning their hopes on homeowners renegotiating their mortgages. The trouble is, the banks are saying no 80% of the time. 
Mortgage Fraud Examiners can help you get the leverage you need to turn things around. They estimate that up to 85% of all mortgages are legally deficient. Mortgage Fraud Examiners can perform a mortgage transaction analysis and an appraisal to find legal deficits in your mortgage. It's like CSI for your home loan. Banks and lenders suddenly start cooperating when faced with a lawsuit for violating lending laws or appraisal fraud. Find out how Mortgage Fraud Examiners can help you. Visit Mortgage Fraud Examiners. Call 844-920-7200. That's 844-920-7200. AM FM 247, the best in talk and music, all day and every day. 